Hello everyone, I'm Connor, and for those of you who don't know what this is, it's a rugby ball. Now, today I'm going to show you how you throw a rugby ball. You might want to throw it like a football, but that's actually wrong. Because if you hold your hands up here like you're going to throw and somebody tackles you, you leave yourself open to some serious hurt. Now, in rugby, if you guys aren't aware of the rules, you have to pass backwards or sideways. It cannot be a forward pass, otherwise it's a penalty and you have a scrum down. Now, to demonstrate this, I'm going to need a volunteer. Anybody? All right, thank you. So, one of the fundamentals is typically you throw it down lower, because if you get tackled and you fall on the ball, that's how it's better to present it to your team and they can recover it. So you tend to throw lower, and you want to spin it with your right hand while you direct the direction with your left hand. Your left hand doesn't really move much, but your right hand does most of the throwing. So you throw it like that. Thank you. So by doing this and throwing your ball, you can it opens up your offense to a lot more plays that they can do. So perfecting your throwing technique is critical to scoring points and tries. So can you try it now? Look at that form. He's a natural. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Thank you guys. Have a good night. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dick Horn, and I just have one question for all of you. Who here likes to snack throughout the day? Well, I know that I personally love to snack throughout the day, and one of my favorite snacks is guacamole. It's a simple recipe that has multiple variations, and today I'll be telling you how to make the most basic form of the recipe, to which additional ingredients can be added to, depending on personal preference. Now, the first step in making guacamole is to obtain an avocado. Once an avocado is obtained, the next step is to clean the avocado, simply by running it under clean tap water. Once the avocado has been cleaned, the next step is to take a sharp knife and cleanly slice through the avocado, avoiding the pit in the middle. Once the avocado has been separated, the next step is to separate the skin from the inner of the avocado. This can simply be done by taking a spoon and scooping out the innards and placing them into a bowl. Once the innards have been placed into a bowl, a fork can be taken and mash, and mash the avocado to the desired level of consistency, depending on how chunky or smooth one wishes their guacamole to be. Once the desired level of consistency has been reached, additional ingredients can be added. My personal preferences are salt, pepper, lemon, and lime juice. When adding these additional ingredients, it's imperative that not too much is added at one time, and they are added in incremental levels, as to not overpower the taste of the avocado. This is especially true when adding lemon or lime juice due to the extremely potent flavors of the ingredients. Once any additional ingredients have been added, the guacamole is complete and all you need is a bag of chips and your snack is ready to enjoy. Thank you. John here? No, not. Uh, sorry, is, is that John? Yes. yes. I think I've got you. I'm sorry, Lily. <clears throat> is that am I correct? H I J K L no, you would be next, wouldn't you? K would be I don't know why my sheet's got tell you what, it doesn't matter. But John. Sorry, Lily, you were right, you are alphabetically okay, next. Hang on a second. Hi guys, my name is John Point, and the goal of my presentation today is to show you guys the proper way to grip, um, the, uh, your proper grip, your proper stance, and your proper technique for swinging a golf club. So to start with the grip, um, if anyone would like to follow along with me, please feel free to. So you'll, if you're a right-handed golf swinger, you'll have your left hand um, on top and your right hand below that. Uh, so if I'm holding the golf club like so, my hands will start out like this. Um, you're going to want to interlock your left index finger between your right ring finger and your right pinky finger so that it looks like this with your two thumbs facing downward. 
So once you have the grip for your golf swing, you then will need to go into your stance, which will be having your legs about shoulder length apart. Uh, for the purpose of this, I'll actually go this way in the presentation. So you'll have your um, arms uh, about parallel uh, being locked together. So then when you go back for the third part, which is the technique of the swing, you'll have your arms going back straight with a slight bend in your left arm while keeping your left arm, your right arm straight, bringing the club back. And then with the follow through, you'll then lock your arms as you go downward. Following through, you'll pull your, um, your right foot off the ground so that you can follow through completely in the swing. And then you're, with your follow through, you'll have your arms both bent back with the club behind your, your, um, your body. So with that, I'll do one more um, full swing. Hopefully I don't hit anything. And that is how to swing golf club. Uh, my, recommenda sorry, my recommendations if you're uh, learning how to play golf are you can uh, start off by watching some YouTube videos, which will help kind of guide you along the process of learning. Um, you can also find a buddy that knows how to play golf, and maybe they can give you some pointers. And ultimately, the most important thing is to just keep practicing. The, the more you practice, the better you get. Um, I know I've been playing golf for about three years, and I still consider myself well below average. But the more I play, the better I get. So it's, it's been an enjoyable experience. Uh, with that, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, guys. Will, are you finally ready? You know, I, I think so. <clears throat> now, how many of you find it easier to place a Band-Aid on your friend than on yourself? Same. Hi, I'm Lily, and today I'm going to teach you how to place a Band-Aid properly on your friend. Um, and I'm going to use my friend Rachel for this example. So first, before you apply any Band-Aid on a person, you want to make sure that your hands are clean. So I have sanitizer here, and I'm going to clean my hands. After you do this step, you want to make sure that you clean the wound on your friend. So she's going to have a wound right over here. I have an alcohol prep, but you can use a clean wash towel, anything you have. All right. So you're going to clean the wound. After you've cleaned the wound, you can go ahead and Place this on the side, and you're going to grab the Band-Aid. Go ahead and open the Band-Aid, like so. Be careful not to rip it. Okay, now this is the trick. If you don't want to get the Band-Aid stuck on your hand, you're going to pull the flaps back, but not all the way. Now you're going to place it on your friend and apply pressure. Make sure all the air bubbles are out. There you go. You have successfully applied a Band-Aid. Thank you. I just have one question. Is it any different if you put a Band-Aid on your enemy? I'm just, I'm just curious. Same technique? <coughs> All right, Sean. My name is Sean, and I'm very interested with how people work, and since Valentine's Day just passed, I figured I would talk about love. Uh, the Greeks actually classified it six different ways. Uh, the way you love your parents is a lot different than the way you love your significant other, I would think. So uh, one of the ways is Eros, which is the way we all classically think of it, the way you would think of your significant other. The other is ludus. That's the playful side. So that's the, that's the side where you, you laugh with your best friend and you love humor, their humor and such. Uh, philia is the long last, is the, uh, is the deep friendship you have. So that's, that's actually not your significant other. That would be your best friend that you feel like you would die for the same way. Uh, pragma is the, is the um, oops, sorry. Pragma is the long lasting one. So that's the, that's the one you would gain the latest in your life and it's the last love you'll ever, the last love uh, type you'll ever gain, which is a marriage. So that could take anywhere from 10, <coughs> 20, 30 years to gain. And agape is the one that uh, has a lot of religious support. So the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, that's speaking about agape, which is uh, 
of the love of everyone, despite even if you don't know them. And uh, the last one is philosia, which is the love of yourself. Uh, it said that the longest relationship you'll ever have is with yourself. So you better love that, or else it'll be a lot harder to love anything else. So, <laughs> so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Matthew? Matthew here? Oh, um, Pash? Um, so I just went to the bathroom. <laughs> Marissa? So do you want, do you mind to do Pash, you ready? Pash. You ready? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I want to keep things going. Yep. <clears throat> Unless you needed that extra two minutes. Sorry. Hello, everyone. My name is Paz. I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk in front of you all today. In today's presentation, I'm going to talk about what is data mining and why I choose to present about data mining. Are you guys familiar with data mining? Any of us? Do you mind to share a few sentences like what do you know about data mining? What do you know about it? Yeah. Um, I've been sent this data mining. There you go. So let me generalize it more. So data mining, it generalizes the information which can be how to increase revenue and reduce costs <clears throat> to a company like Amazon and eBay by processing or analyzing a large database. So I choose to present about data mining <clears throat> because it is everywhere these days. Like <clears throat> social networking sites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they use data mining for search relevance and for relevant advertisement and for other many beneficial types they can use for. So, I think it is important to be aware about data mining these days. Thank you for your attention. So in 2006, Sophia Amoroso started selling her vintage clothing on eBay, and she called her shop Nasty Gal Vintage. And she was just doing this to make some extra money, and she didn't expect that in just a couple short years, she'd be the founder and CEO of a multi-million dollar company. Um, she would buy clothing at their stores and like Salvation Army and everything, and she would sell it back to people for more than double, triple what she would pay for it. And she was in charge of everything business related at this time because she couldn't afford to hire anyone else to work for her. But then in 2008, she was forced to move off of eBay because she violated the website's pilot, pilot policy. Sorry. And so she created nastygal.com, which is where customers can still shop today. But today, not only do they sell vintage designer clothing, such as like Chanel items and everything, but they also sell new clothing and footwear and accessories that you can buy. And the majority of people who shop at Nasty Gal are women in their 20s who have a daring sense of fashion and aren't afraid to take risks and just wear what they think is cool. And since opening, Nasty Gal has become one of the fastest growing companies and continues to make larger profits every year. And Sophia really um, credits this growth to social media because it was a, plat a platform that she was able to use to promote her business and really get people interested and since then, over the past 10 years, the company has been able to hire over 100 employees and they even opened two brick and mortar stores in California. Thank you.
everyone. As a college student, I have many bad habits. I oversleep. I sometimes I don't get enough sleep. I overeat when I'm stressed out. Uh, I hold off on writing 10 page papers until the night before, and I can't even count the number of nights I've spent on studying for a single exam. Many students like me may share, may share the same bad habits that I have. Eventually, we get to a point where it's detrimental to our health, our <coughs> education, and sometimes even our relationships. So what causes these bad habits to stick, and what do we do to get rid of them? It's something that goes along the lines of trigger, behavior, reward. I stress myself out, which would be the trigger. Um, I overeat, which would be the behavior. And then I feel a temporary sensation of um, relief or happiness, which would be the reward. Now this can apply to almost anything, good habits or bad habits, uh, whether it's smoking cigarettes, playing a sport, um, playing a game of chess, or craving sugar. These positive and negative reinforcements on our content-based memory, content based, um, dependent memory, uh, remembers these behaviors and almost applies them naturally. The brain process, this brain, oh, this brain process can help us learn something, but if it's harmful, it can take a toll on our daily lives. Um, the way to train our brain is to understand this process and consciously make better decisions and to be curious, as well as use our cognitive ability to be mindful. For example, cigarette smokers don't necessarily quit on their first, quit on their first attempt. Uh, with mindfulness training, they would have to stop themselves between the trigger and the behavior. Smoke, but be aware and be curious while you're smoking. Eventually, smokers will realize smoking tastes like shit and it's harmful to their, um, to their health. Mindfulness is about seeing clearly, um, seeing really clearly what we are like when we're caught up in our behaviors. Naturally, if we're careful, bad habits will go away. If they don't magically just disappear, we'll eventually just replace them with better habits. I learned to eat granola or a piece of fruit instead of downing a box of chocolates. So it's all about teaching our bodies and our minds from moment to moment. My name is Charmaine Arpon, and I hope I've helped you guys um, learn how to get rid of some of your bad habits.